Um, well, thank you very much, uh, especially to Jean-Jacques for inviting me. And this is a real pleasure because one of the first things I do every semester when I teach my hominin paleoecology class is start with the East Side Story. Not that. Okay, so today I want to talk a little bit about Paranthibus boisei, which we just heard a lot about, and a little bit about Lucy and her oak as well. Now, we're going to be talking about diet, and of course this is of enormous interest to paleoanthropologists, but it's the kind of thing that resonates in the public sphere very much as well, right? Everyone's heard of the paleo diet. You go on to a bookstore, you can see these things just absolutely abound. And they really are about, people have this sense that many modern diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, some cancers, may result from some imbalance between our current lifestyles and diets relative to our long established biology. And while I do think the idea of grounding current debates about modern diet and evolutionary theory and, and evolutionary understanding is a good thing, this stuff often just goes beyond the pale, right? There are a lot of paleo fantasies. Nowadays, the big version of this that is getting a lot of attention is sort of the carnivore diet, where some people are arguing for the last two million years or so, humans ate almost nothing but meat. And while it is notable that you rarely come across cave paintings of salads, I do not think that that means that those hominins were indifferent to such fare, right? Now, on the more serious side of this, um, you know, going back to people like Darwin and many people since, we've had this notion that some sort of change in diet, the means of procuring subsistence, has been a key step in hominization, the creation of humans. Of course, the same arguments have been made about Homo, which we're going to hear about in the next talk. And indeed, among the Australopiths, things like Lucy, things like Paranthropus boisei, a lot of the fundamental differences that we see have often been related to diet. So this is absolutely central to a host of questions about what has happened during the evolution of our lineage. And just because Zarai put up a slide this morning on the osteodontocratic culture of Raymond Dart, I thought I would throw this in. Because yes, hunting was a big part in, in that idea of hominization. He basically argued because of environmental change. But I just want to note that apparently from his book here, it's also very clear that Australopithecus had very curvaceous backsides, which I think not many people knew. Anyway. Um, on the serious side, we're always learning more about hominin diet. But in 2,000 years, something happened, right? You can think of it as an Annus mirabilis, perhaps, perhaps an Annus horribilis, however the correct pronunciation is. But we had these two studies which broke, or sort of, the relative equanimity of the field. At that point, most people, for instance, believe that when you looked at this specimen, which had been nicknamed Nutcracker Man, that, well, it probably ate nuts, or at least a reasonable mechanical facsimile thereof. After 2008, it became less certain that that was real. And if that wasn't real, because that seemed so obvious from the morphology, could there have been a lot of other things wrong? And I would argue that this disruptive moment, and we're going to talk about just how disruptive that has been. We've spent so much time on Paranthropus boisei that we perhaps have been neglecting other hominin taxa that perhaps need a little bit of dietary revision. And I think afarensis is especially one of them. One of the reasons, of course, is that Early Paranthropus, well, its ancestor, its direct ancestor probably was Australopithecus afarensis. And we're going to talk about some other reasons for that as well. Now, before we get into some of the proxies that we use to talk about diet, I just want to sort of ground this in sort of a traditional morphological understanding at a very basic, basic level. And right, so when we look at an afarensis kind of mandible, 
It's notably different from a chimpanzee. One of the things that jumps out, right, you don't have a big canine there. In addition, though, there's some really important things in the post-canine or the back chewing teeth. One, for instance, they tend to be relatively expanded, relatively larger than you would see in a chimpanzee. And this you see here in the megadontia quotient. Megadon, so like giant tooth, like megalodon. Anyway, what you're seeing here is Homo, our species, and chimpanzees, we have more or less these cheek teeth that are the size expected from a primate ever body size, kind of have average teeth. When we look at Lucy, quite a bit bigger. Paranthrop Paranthropus boisei, it's just broken. It's the other side of the scale. We'll come back to that, okay? But that certainly suggests some sort of dietary difference, like way bigger teeth. In addition, we can look at things like the enamel that covers those teeth, right? And we look at that dental enamel, you'll note that this is where most chimpanzees fall in sort of a relative enamel th thickness is this green line. When you look at like the M2 of Australopithecus afarensis, way up here, massively different from something like a chimpanzee. And when you start putting these things together, much larger teeth, much thicker enamel, now there are lots of ways to interpret this, but one pretty obvious way is these are adaptations that we see in many lineages that seem to extend the life of the dental battery, right? It means that you can eat the same thing and eat it for longer without going to dental obsolescence, right? Now, this can be especially important in certain circumstances where you might be eating lots of hard or gritty foods. And this had been one of the sort of traditional understandings of afarensis, and I think to, in many ways it still is. And part of this you can think of as like a mini expulsion from Eden hypothesis, right, where the idea is that afarensis, while it's in a great diversity of habitats, they are not typically, you know, closed forest chimpanzee-like habitats. And as a consequence, you're not going to have the same density of fleshy fruits, which are the preferred food of chimpanzees. And what do you do in those kind of habitats? Well, at least seasonally, you, you know, you might utilize different things from, let's say, fever trees or various other acacia types. You might use seed pods. Right? And the seeds in these can be quite true nutritions, but are very hard. And in fact, they're a favorite food, at least seasonally, of baboons. Right? You might eat grass seeds seasonally. Right? Very nutritious. You might even eat the underground portions of grasses, the roots, the rhizomes, some of the stolons on the surface. All of these are things that are not typically eaten by chimpanzees, even when they are in these more open environments. And there are some savanna chimpanzee populations, which we'll come back to briefly. Okay? So the idea here is that afarensis should, should be sort of a chimpanzee plus. You wouldn't expect it to turn down the things that a chimpanzee would love to eat but you would expect it to be better than a chimpanzee at utilizing new kinds of things on offer in more open environments. Okay, so I think that's a reasonable description of the traditional understanding here. Now, fortunately, when you're talking about eating harder foods, potentially gritty foods from open environments, we do have a technique that is well-placed to answer such questions, like, did afarensis do this? And one of them is dental microware. And microware is the, the microscopic pits and scratches that are left on your teeth as you eat. Okay? And one thing that we know is when you look at a tooth and you see lots of pits, as you're seeing here, right, that's typically what you find with an animal that eats fruits, but even a lot of seed, hard fruits and seeds, hard things, tend to get very pitted. Fleshy fruit eaters tend to be in between this and that. And this side here, this is what you typically find with animals that are eating a lot of leaves, okay? So you would expect to see maybe not this in afarensis, but you would expect it to not be this, somewhere in the middle showing some of these pits, right? Because it's in these new environments, it's eating potentially these hard and gritty foods. Now, I will just briefly mention that there was some early work done on the microware of afarensis. 
And I think this didn't really get as much attention as perhaps it deserved. And one of the reasons in some cases, not this one here, but in some cases, um, the studies were very, relatively small or unknown sample size and quite qualitative, so I think people weren't sure what to do with. Also, these studies tended to be focused on the anterior dentition, which is very important for diet, but also can tell you about things that are not always directly related to diet. And so I think that people were not quite sure what to do with this. And so it didn't shape the dialogue about afarensis diet as perhaps as much as it should have. And we're going to come back to, there are certain things from this paper in particular that ring especially true today. So the first major study to look at these molars, right, the teeth that we usually use for microware to talk about diet, was this in 2006. It took a long time to get this done. And there were some legitimate surprises here, right? The expectation, given what I just said, is you might expect afarensis, which is here, to sort of fall not exactly like a chimpanzee, which you see here, but sort of maybe here or kind of in this space, right, where it looks a little bit like a chimpanzee, but that it's also got baboon-like elements and things like that. Right? We're eating some underground storage organs, things that are gritty, some hard nuts and things. And in fact, that's not what happened at all. As you'll see, the overlap is nearly total with that of a gorilla. And in this case, gorillas that are eating primarily leaves. There's some diversity in gorilla populations. We don't need to go into that here. So that was a bit strange. And I think we weren't really sure what to make of it but it didn't seem terribly disruptive. One other notable element of this study was that they had samples from this over a 400,000-year time period. And over 400,000 years, there was no evidence of change in microware over time, which was intriguing, right? You might expect, well, you should have variation year-round for that time and in very different areas, and none. Moreover, when you looked at the environmental information that was available, environment seemed to have no impact on microware either. And this was a good sample of teeth. So this is legitimately a strange counterintuitive finding. And once again, I think we just kind of absorbed it and didn't think about what that might mean <laughs> as a field. And I count myself among the people who kind of tried to minimize the significance of that, and I think we have to get back to it. Anyway, now microware, when it was applied to Boise eyes, when things got really weird, right? Um, Bernard put up, you know, found July 17th, 1959 by Mary Leakey. Um, you've got this remarkable, highly derived cranium with lots of evidence for massive muscles of mastication robust facial architecture and mandibles, massively expanded premolars and molars, very thick enamel, and this ultimately got nicknamed Nutcracker Man. And I think you can see why it kind of looks like a nutcracker. Okay. Now, the thing is, if anything, right, is going to have that microware signature of hard object feeding, it should be this. And yet, when they did it, now, I'm slightly changing the rules of the game for you here because sort of the modern way of dealing with like this pitting is to do it in terms of complexity. A highly complex surface is basically a highly pitted surface. Okay. And so Boise Eye should have been up here. In fact, talking to one of my colleagues who did this, they had to redo the results three times because they didn't believe their own results. Okay. Boise Eye should look like it's eating nuts, but it didn't. Okay. And intriguingly, what did it look almost exactly like? Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, which looks like basically all leaf-eating primates, and including the grass-eating gelata baboon, which maybe we will revisit in a moment. Now, if this wasn't enough to suggest that there's something weird going on, um, when people looked at dental chipping, which is sort of related to wear in a way. And the idea with dental chipping in the teeth is that if you're putting high magnitude sort of loads on these teeth, occasionally you're going to get these little 
little chips taken off. And it has been found that, yes, when you look at animals that tend to eat, you know, hard and gritty things, they tend to have a quite high chipping frequency. Those that are leaf eaters have a low chipping frequency. When you look at Australopithecus afarensis, when you look at Paranthemus boisei, ridiculously low chipping frequency. Exactly what you would expect from sort of a leaf consumer and not a hard object consumer. Now this isn't dispositive in and of itself, but you put this together, there's an intriguing picture emerging that is not what anyone would have imagined 20 years ago. So what exactly is going on with Australopithecus afarensis, much less boisei? don't really look like classic fruit eaters, okay? But let's look to another proxy now to sort of help us work through these data. And this is carbon isotope analysis. And in brief, the idea here is that there are C3 and C, there's a C3 and C4 photosynthetic pathway. And in African savannas, your trees, your bushes and things like that tend to use C3 photosynthesis your grasses, some sedges, tend to use C4 photosynthesis. And because of biochemical and some physical differences in these plants, they have different ratios of carbon 13 to 12 in their tissues. And these differences are passed down into the animals that consume fruits, the animals that consume grass. So that when you actually look at bovids in an African ecosystem, right, the ones that graze, that eat grass, like wildebeest, they are very different looking from things like this. This is a diker here, little fruit eater. And so you can easily tell the, the fruit and leaf eaters from trees apart from grass eaters. And then occasionally you get something like the impala, the cockroach of Africa, um, that can sort of swing both ways. That's actually extremely rare among herbivores and African mammals, which is an interesting research question in and of itself today, at least. Okay. So, you would have expected when we looked at these hominins, if they are doing things like gorillas and chimpanzees, they should be very C3. And sort of to give you a little context here, I'm including data from a whole number of things. There's something to break down here. These are forest chimpanzees. Okay. And this is where forest chimpanzees fall. And I've kind of cheated here because I've included things from forest, forest populations that are right next to villages. And so they do a lot of crop raiding so they can get kind of high. But the reality is most forest individuals are right in this range here. Okay. These are chimpanzees in savanna areas where there's a lot of grass around. Okay. Places like Fungoli, places like Ugala. And you'll see they have a fairly tight range, but this is basically consistent with almost 100% C3 vegetation. I threw in for context here, this is uh, Shiva Pithecus from the Shawaliks um, nine million years ago in, in Pakistan. And this looks very much like a forest chimpanzee today, which is hardly surprising. When we look at Australopithecus onamensis, not much different from a savanna chimpanzee, right? We can quibble over that. Artipithecus, largely the same, though this one specimen in particular really probably is significantly different. But then when we look at Lucy, I mean, Lucy doesn't know what's going on, right? Lucy's all over the place. You have one specimen that is indisputably looks like a forest animal. Okay? And then you have something that looks like it doesn't know what a forest is, right? Hugely different, massive range. I thought I'd point out when we look at the earliest hominins in the Omo as well, we see a fairly similar range with uh, quite a few animals that are in this kind of chimpanzee space, but then they're willing to eat lots of different things. This is, I think, isotopically is exactly what we would have expected from that traditional model based upon morphology and environment, right? You do chimpanzee things, but environmentally you might be forced to occasionally do things that chimpanzees won't do. And Australopithecus afarensis and its close kin look like that's exactly what was going on. Now, of course, Paranthemus boisei, like, 
this is completely different from any existing hominoid. In fact, we don't have any primate period that looks like this. So it just looks like it is following its own completely separate path. Now, the one thing I just want to briefly mention, I really, I do not have much time here, is that Boise Eye clearly looks different. But if you were to look at the earliest representatives of Paranthropus in Eastern Africa, the story is, is intriguing. So this is just looking at smoothed values for a variety of families in the Omo over time. And as you can see, things like giraffe don't really change what they do. You know, some, you know, equids and things like that, there's a little change, but yeah, they eat grass. No one's surprised that zebra and things like that eat grass. Look at the hominins, though. They do something completely unlike anything else. And it's worth pointing out that at this period of time where we first start seeing Paranthropus, they do not look any different than Australopithecus. Okay? So there is a period of time for which we have the isotopes of Paranthropus are identical to Australopithecus. As far as we know, the microware is identical to that of Australopithecus. And then almost overnight, literally within like 100,000 years, everything changes. And part of me thinks that that's very unlikely to be classic environmental forcing, like the environment's just changed massively, because you don't see anything like that change in other taxa. Sure, there are changes over time, but nothing nearly, right, this abrupt. So I think it could be related to other things, possibly related to wetland environments. We may or may not be. Oh, and I just have this up here because I just wanted to acknowledge one person who's really important to this work is Bill Kimball, who, of course, we lost recently as well. So what did Boise I eat in the C4 side? Okay. Now, the obvious answer to anyone who is not in paleoanthropology, and this doesn't mean it's the right answer, but the obvious answer would be grass. Why? Because the bulk of all material that's capable of producing a Paranthropus boisei-like carbon isotope composition is grass. 98% of everything that could cause that isotopic composition is grass. In addition, when you look at you know, large herbivorous mammals in the world with a similar isotopic composition, literally 100% of them are grass eaters, and not just grass eaters, above ground grass eaters, though they may eat some underground parts as well. Okay, so we have no exceptions to that rule. And so it would be a pretty obvious thing to say, well, they look like all these grazing herbivores, that's by far the most abundant thing out there, maybe they're eating grass. Now, it doesn't mean that's what actually happened, but um, I will point out too here that uh, Zarai and Rene Bobet did some work some time ago where they pointed out that when you look at Paranthropus boisei in the Omo and you look at the things that it's most associated with, it's highly associated with the grass-eating gelata, okay? whereas Homo with Papio and things like Trigelophus. So that suggests potentially some kind of habitat nexus or some similarity in ecology, maybe, However, very recent study that came out suggested that while well, Boise Eye actually has a fairly narrow habitat relative to Homo, but relative to most other animals in the Kubifora formation, so much more restricted than many grazers, um, it is not hugely different from that of Menelikia, redundant bovid, which potentially is suggestive. So anyway, what are other ways to get this sort of C4 signature other than grass? Well, you could eat termites or ants. There are certain species that eat lots of grass, and so you can get the, that carbon isotope signature by eating them, right? And if you are something like an aardwolf, and you can eat a quarter of a million or more of them a night, sure, you could get a Boise eye like signature, but, you know, and unfortunately, we don't have any evidence that Boise had a sticky tongue and spent all night licking earth but I think it's probably not super likely for a whole bunch of reasons, energetically as well. It just doesn't make sense for something of that body size. Of course, you could eat other animals, whether through direct hunting, whether through you know, confrontational scavenging, you know, baboons saying, cheetah, get the hell out of here. This is now my kill. 
I put this up here only because a re reviewer recently told me I had to include this in one of my papers. And they pointed out that, well, theoretically, you could be eating feces. Yes, it is theoretically possible that Paranthropus boisei could have been eating the feces of grazing herbivores. And there are, in fact, some animals that will eat quite a bit of feces. When you look in, in this particular Congo population, you can see some hogs you know, can have 33% of their diet consisting of feces. And male sitatunga, well, well, you're not dealing with males there, but um, over 50% at times. But here's the thing, what they're eating here is basically elephant feces. And they're actually avoiding the fibrous part, which is where you're gonna get all the C4. They're really just picking out the seeds. And that's generally what primates do too when they eat feces. So, so I think it's, and I have a lot of other reasons why I think this is super, super unlikely. And I'm really glad that that is, because I think if we ever had to rename Nutcracker Man the shit eater, the field might never recover. So, okay. So one other thing, possibility is <laughs> underground storage organs. I clearly talk too long. Um, and yeah, that's possible. The below ground parts of things like sedges. Now, what I want to briefly do is point out that grass obviously is the default option, right? It's the, it's the simplest way to explain what we have. That doesn't mean that's what they were doing. But one of the real problems is how could they do this if they have really flat teeth? And flat teeth are not what you expect if you have to go through a tough material like grass, right? So if they're eating this, you know, are there any analogies? The panda might be an analogy, okay? De Brol noted long ago that, you know, what's sort of a, like a grizzly bear to a panda is like Australopithecus to Paranthropus, and he noted that they have major similarities, much shorter snouts, massive and bowed zygomatic arches, massively expanded premolars and molars. Really, they look very convergent in a number of ways, and suggested this had to do with the mechanical properties of food. They're doing lots and lots of chewing. In a panda's case, we know it's bamboo. This is a really interesting analogy, though, because if you want to take this to its fullest extent and say, OK, pandas have relatively low crown teeth, and they eat tough foods, well, how do they do it? The thing is, we all know pandas are very strange and wonderful animals. Not many people realize that pandas love bamboo, but they can't really eat it. Actually, what I should say is they can't digest it, okay? Pandas digest almost none of the bamboo that they eat, okay? Often 20, at most 30%. This it pales in comparison to that of other herbivores, which will tend to eat, you know, get 60, even 80% of the food they eat. So they are awful, awful herbivores. And to compensate for that, well, actually, so what you see here, right, panda feces is basically, this is panda feces, this is if you disaggregate it, right, you just pull it apart. You can see it's basically just a bunch of undigested bamboo, okay? The upside of that is it's such a gentle process that it's now the first step in making toilet paper in China. So, you know, from a panda's ass to yours, um, you can now... So now to deal with this, they, 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 of course, they digest none of it, so they have to eat this enormous quantity, and they get rid of it very quickly. So they eat it, it's gone in eight hours. And so the big question that I, I, I leave with you, because obviously I don't have time to go into this in much more detail, is just to say, well, if Paranthropus boisei ate tough foods, and a lot of people believe that's the case. It's not like that we're done on that, but certainly we have to take very seriously the possibility of tough food consumption, okay? If they ate it, and if they have very flat molars, which are not good for getting through tough vegetation, would there have been consequences for their digestive kinetics or digestive strategy, right? We typically look at teeth and we're done there, but the teeth are connected to the rest of the digestive system. And if you have teeth that can't break this down, that doesn't mean you can't eat that food, but it means you have to have a digestive strategy that is completely unlike any living hominoid, where they tend to break their food particles down to small sizes and then spend a long time digesting it. 
The other side is don't break it down and expel it from the body and just have massive quantities. This could be something what you would expect a high wear gradient, enormous amount of wear on teeth because you're just processing way more food than your typical hominoid. So I'm just going to, I mean, I think I don't have any more time, so why don't we just leave it there and just say, you know, occasionally we get things that we don't anticipate as these goats here. Paranthemus boisei is perhaps not eating things that we traditionally expected based upon morphology. And that given that afarensis, probably the direct ancestor of the earliest Paranthemus, Paranthemus ethiopicus, similar microword Paranthemus boisei, okay, and isotopically, early Paranthemus is the same as afarensis. I do wonder if any of these sort of strange stories that we maybe can start talking about with regard to digestive strategy of Paranthemus boisei, maybe there's just an inkling of something that we need to be thinking out for Lucy as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>